When money is your God, you are never going to be fulfilled. You are never going to be happy. Because no matter how much you have, it is never going to be enough. Ted Turner. Hello world. Hello world. This is www.i955fm.com. Trinidad. This Sunday on episode 6 of Eye on Dependency. The old people have a saying. Friends does carry it, but they don't bring it back. Meet Akini. He explains what it's like being arrested and spending time on remand. We were exposed to conditions that we were unfamiliar with. Having to defecate in a hole in the ground. And as a child growing up, we hear certain things about what remand is like. And actually having to be there to see the slop tears and that kind of stuff. It was a real awakening. Fortunately, the goodly magistrate tempered justice with mercy. And now, Akini has a degree in criminology. Get your boy child and join us this Sunday from 6.15 p.m. for I on Dependency, where every life is a biography, exclusively on I-95.5 FM and live on the I on Dependency Facebook page. Maybe your son or daughter can learn from this story. Tell someone. This is Eye on Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Sundays at 6.15 p.m. on the most influential name in radio, I-95.5 FM. Good evening, good evening, welcome to Iron Dependency, right here live on I-95.5 FM and live on the Iron Dependency Facebook page. Good evening, Garth. Good evening, Trinidad and Tobago, and welcome to Iron Dependency, right here on I-95.5 and live on Iron Dependency Facebook page, isn't that it? <laughs> and of course, Chris here, short man, is at the other end, and we have Akini standing by to educate you this evening it is a real pleasure for us to do this um you remember at the end of the year when we did the last program for the year 2020 we spoke about the magistrate of the year mm -hmm. and we really <coughs> excuse me we were really grateful that this magistrate saw it fit to give a young man a, a break give him a bligh, and you know it's um it's, it's it turned out well doesn't always happen like that because we have right now I'm dealing with someone who has to go before a magistrate and we don't know how that will turn out but we'll get to that in a while because we have that video to show you but also I think what I would like people to take away from this evening's interview is that not everyone who has an encounter with the police or the prison system is a criminal and or a monster because we hear a lot of talk about monsters these days right and while it's very serious crimes like murder and rape and kidnapping deserve a certain kind of treatment there are many 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 more people who encounter police encounter and end up in prison 
who are not violent criminals. And we often, you know, mix up the two, for lack of, lack of a better term, in, in the sense that we ascribe guilt to people who police put their hands on, and far less for if you're reaching prison, that stain is impossible to wash off. And I think Akini's story this evening will help to demonstrate that not everyone who ends up in prison or is held by police is a lost cause. They can't turn their life around with the help, of course, of persons who are in authority and in a position to help. Not only that, um, we are not condoning wrongdoing at all. Of course Because not. he made a wrong choice. Yep. Now remember, there are people say mistakes and, and wrong choice. Mm. I, I, I'm, you know, some people say, look, I make a mistake. But there are mistakes and there are choices. And if you put on the wrong uniform to go to work and everybody else in blue and you in red, that's a mistake. You forgot. But if you decide with the insistence of a friend or the probing of a friend to bow to peer pressure and commit a crime, that was your choice to do. People make these choices for different reasons. This evening you will hear about that. But you will also hear about someone realizing, look, if I get a, if I get a bligh, I'm going to turn my life around and I wouldn't have to go back before this magistrate. And this is what Akini did. And we felt that it was such a compelling story that we give you time to call anyone you know with a son or a daughter who has the propensity to be going down this road. You see, right now, we have a style in this country where going to prison is a rank. Hmm. Not understanding that years later, as we will show you here about having a conviction, and so you will see a picture of the presidential pardon. Again, you will see instructions how to acquire a presidential pardon. That's another discussion for us to have going forward because we don't know what is going on with that. And the Mercy they are, Committee. The, with the Mercy Committee and all of these things, when they meet, when they're going to meet, and was it condition for someone getting a pardon? If someone goes to prison and um, for, 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 let's say, larceny of fruits, and spent three months in prison. Okay, that will stay on his record for a very long time. So if the person decides to turn their life around, 10 years later, they apply for a police certificate of good character, it's going to come up. How do we fix this? Is this something should be timed so that, oh, there should be a probationary period when, upon the release? If somebody gets, well, in, in a kidney case, he, gets, he got a bond, he will tell you what he has to do, even though he will get a clean police to be get a good character what he still has to do to get that and um it is is something that haunting a lot of people up to this day there are people who are going to apply for jobs and when their name comes up there's a there's a, a record attached to it from it could be from 25 years ago 25 but it's years still ago there. yeah it's still there it will be always there yeah. so to youngsters now who insist on not listening to their parents and following a certain crowd. You may, you may be in a zone right now. You may feel it's childhood. You may feel you could do what you want. But let's say you decide to turn your life around. Then it's going to come back to bite you really hard. So we give you that opportunity to, 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 to warn someone or get someone to the radio to listen. Then we're going to, we have images of a certain marijuana that supposedly it has the same reaction people reacting like they're using crack cocaine um then there is a um the the uh, the image of of a, a, a brother who who crack destroyed and i don't think people really understand how powerful these drugs are i don't know what they're putting in in certain marijuana now but to just remind you too, Dr. Pottinger now has a YouTube page um, that you can go. He's given, you know, parents, you can visit Dr. Pottinger on YouTube. Just type in his name and and, and he has a, a, a weekly, I think, uh, broadcast now on YouTube that he will guide you along on this marijuana thing. Um, you know, he we really respect him for his knowledge on that where that is concerned. So 
there are a number of things that will come out of this story this evening. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, you're going to hear from Akini how he dodged th- that bullet, why he got himself where he was, and what he's doing now with his life is a perfect example of getting an opportunity and grabbing it with both hands. And again, we thank the magistrate. That's just one less. Then there's the, the, the question of the drug treatment facility in prison. Again, which was shut down under uh, the last administration and never reopened. So now people go into prison who should actually be di- guided and directed to the drug treatment um, facility in prison. Uh, it's too much. So many things <laughs> it's too much. to discuss from this one testimony you will hear this evening. So again, uh, let's take that break. Yes, let's take and that break. And when we come break. back, we'll be joined by Akini Henry. We'll be back. This is Reality Radio at its best. I on Dependency on I-95.5 FM. I on Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Reality Radio at its best. Where every life is a biography. Sundays at 6.15 p.m. and exclusively on I-95.5 FM. And broadcast live on the Eye on Dependency Facebook page. Agricola is back with loan promotions that will make you go wow! Wow! The computer and internet bundle CIB loan. Get a maximum of $15,000 with just a 0.75% interest rate. Call or come into our offices at Pro Queen Street Arima 6677633, Pamela's Mall Marabella 2197745, Scarborough Tobago 6396468 or Port of Spain 6273127. Agricola Credit Union, your very own, working for you. Get mama phone. Get mama phone. What are you doing taking them kind of pictures? I'll tell mommy. And I'll tell her you invaded my privacy. Privacy? When you send those pics, you lose all privacy. It's like setting up a billboard with your naked pics for the world to see. Those pictures are for my boyfriend's eyes only, and he'll never do that to me. Yes, he can, or one of his friends or family, or someone can see his phone. (laughs) <laughs> Sending naked pics can open you up to embarrassment for you, your family and friends. You can be harassed by bullies. Your pics can be uploaded to websites and seen by everybody, even the wrong people. Mm. Sex offenders. <laughs> it can also affect you getting a good job in the future. Once those pictures go out, you can never get them back. Okay. I'll tell my boyfriend to delete them, and I'll delete these. I'm glad I have a smart little sister. I'm still telling mommy. Child labor is when I cannot. Go to school, play with friends, go to the beach, go to the movies, ride my bike, rollerblade, or do other fun activities because I am forced to work. Report child labor to the Labor Inspectorate Unit at 299-0300 Option 3, or to Childline at 800-4321. I'm Mava and you listen to Eye on Dependency with Garth and Natasha on I-95.5 FM, Trinidad and Tobago. Don't be a fool and be a mule. Right, so thank you uh, very much. Akini, I think you have to turn on your volume or something. We're getting a little yeah, feedback. feedback yeah. So, my check one, two. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay, great. Okay, great. Is that personal? 
Yes. Yes, yes. And we're hearing you clearly as well. Right. So we have Akini who has agreed to join us via Facebook this evening and face the cameras, face you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago and tell the story. Tell us about... Let, let, let us see if he could try to save a life or two out there of a young man or woman who insists that they must go down a road that does not make sense. So Akini, welcome once again. And when I when I got... Is, is there a kind of Delivery. delay? It sounds like slight delay. Tell you, are you still hearing us? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Are you hearing me? We right, are, but you need to in, um. It's just a slight delay. Yeah, and I'm sort of hearing him in the background. Cause I don't know if you. I don't know if you you hear it. Yeah. Right. So Akini, uh, thank you very much. And as I was explaining to the listener, we we had we praised the magistrate for saving your life, literally, because you could have been still in prison, or probably just on your way out because of that bad that wrong choice that you made but the magistrate saw something in you that she felt you know what let me give you a chance to redeem yourself and she did and now i'm sure if she's listening this evening she can say well yes i made the right choice so let me give you listen a brief history of this when former Karpi Chima East footballer Akini Harry was arrested in 2014 in relation to a $30,000 theft, he thought his life was over. But thanks to the right people supporting him and through hard work and determination, the then 18-year-old Harry has turned his life around and is now a college graduate. Now 22 years old with a degree in criminology, Harry's story is far from finished thanks to a post about his attaining a degree which went viral on social media. Harry, who is currently a taxi driver, is being invite, invited to several schools and even prison to give motivational speeches. He plans to pursue, pursue a master's degree in criminology. Now, Harry's story may soon be available to everyone because he's also writing a book. And um, speaking, you spoke with the news day. You recall the moment police stormed his Cedar Hill Claxton Bay home with a warrant for his arrest. He told you that that was the start of a chain of events which led him to being the person he is today. And Harry said that um, when he was a student at Kaipi Chima Secondary, who was juggling classes, playing for the football team as a defender and working as a clerk in Empire Cinema. And he said, you know, looking back now, he felt frustrated by the predicament. I was coming to work and being put under pressure every day. I had a bad financial situation. I was struggling for money. I was frustrated. And you will tell us what you and your accomplice did. But, um, you know, is 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 when I when I when I saw the part that um, the magistrate, you know, put you on a bond, and that is magistrate Natalie Diop. I said, wow. You know, um, standing before magistrate Natalie Diop, begging for a second chance in magistrate because of his clean record and because of his academic and sporting achievements. So I feel to give him a second chance. He was pleading for, and he was placed on a bond for two years. Now, Akini, take us on the beginning. Where you grew up, the family, what it was like for you? What school did you attend? Well, of course, we heard Caribbean Chima, but what was it like growing up for you? In Claxton Bay. In Claxton Bay. <laughs> okay, well, allow me to begin by saying how humble I am to be here. Share my story. Now, um, growing up, I grew up in. You have a little stick there, um, short man. I don't know what happened. He's frozen in time there. Yes. <laughs> Some financial struggle with um, my father was very hard with him. He would put up to support his family. Uh, and my mom 
was the well, what you call a housewife. And I attended presentation of the Stanton before I moved on to the third time in the second day. Now, my problems with this person, my problems with this person at the age of 12, when I entered the second day school, now, many people would argue that the onset of, of delinquency or the violence we discussed in the home, but for me, that was different. My struggles with this started at school at the home, when, then, when I even had met certain friends who came from similar financial positions like me, you know, and by the time I was in the home, she was 15. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on a hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, your pit yeah. bull, your pit bull is giving you a little competition in the back there. Did somebody um <laughs> take the dog and put him outside or somewhere else? Wow. It's really um it's really loud. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, I know, I know probably he wanna be interviewed as well, but tell him this is your time here this evening. So so give you a little break. <laughs> right. Um, so and your audio was kinda of going in and out. So we I think um if you could go from uh, you mentioned that you went to presentation college before you transferred to Karapi Chima. So take us from there. Okay, so when I was in the presentation college in twenty and I went to class in China in 2015 mm -hmm. to do my A level. And it was at that time that I got involved with the law. Okay. In July of 2014, was when the initial incident would have occurred. Um, I was working at Empire School of Expansion and Law. And two friends and myself decided to do some of the because of our position at the time. And you know that was the moment when things really went down a little Um we before you before you go on before you go on to that, Akini, um you, you I think I heard you talk about your family life and I want you to um we want you to really expand on that because we you didn't come from a, a broken home. You came from a you know a decent upstanding family so tell us tell us about that first before we get to the that incident yeah well i came from a traditional two parents old mother father two brothers and my sister um, but my problems was not really at home you know because my parents could have provided for, for, for my siblings and i Although it would not have been ideal, you know, we were surviving, you know. Gotcha. Hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing. All right. So, you said the problems were not at home, but how did... Um, how did the thought enter your mind to, to to do something illegal then if you were you know raised with with the values that um, that we all hope our children are going out into the world with now to answer that question we have to understand that children involved in illegal activity via a host of avenues right um when we interact with our peers, um, our community, or the place that we tell um, our school, you know, so there are different factors that, that impact the lives of young people. And for me, that factor would have been, or those factors would have been the community right. as the school that I attended. 
Okay. So when I enter presentation in college, in my cohort, there were a few students like myself who came from what we call poor and to interacting with my peers, I started to learn, you know, things like stealing, gambling, drinking, and that kind of stuff. Yes. And that, that's really how I was introduced into that kind of lifestyle. Gotcha. Understood. I, I, I had a similar experience as well, even though I went to a so-called prestige school, I learned everything I needed to know about sex in Form 1. And that's not really where you're supposed to learn it, right? So you're exposed in that school environment to a lot of things that um, your parents may not, you know, know about or, or, or comprehend. Correct. You know, and, and, and we fail to realize that in today's society, mm-hmm. you know, um, a parent might have a child at home and at home that child is well behaved. However, when he enters out into, into the school environment, it is a different thing. And so, some parents are in denial when it comes to that. So, Akini, before, <coughs> excuse me, before you, were you exposed, <coughs> excuse me, were you exposed to drugs as well? In, in, in the school, or, or was it around you? It was around me, but it's something that I never practiced due to my involvement in sport. Due to your involvement, what? In Sorry? Sport. Or in sport? Yeah. Right. So, but but there there were drugs around you. And, and this is something, too, that we, we tend to keep reminding parents about that in the school environment, there are drugs in the school environment. People don't want to hear it, but it's the truth. And a lot of other things, too, you know, in the mix. Because it's a, I mean, the school is a, is a community in and of itself. This, this is a very long delay. Yeah, I agree. Um. You know, um, children sometimes bring to us some food. You know, you can never tell what your child is being exposed to at school. You know, many, many different children coming from many different backgrounds. You know, it's difficult for a parent to tell. Right. Now, people listening, just like some parents who are listening, would say, okay, you live with both parents. They, 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 they brought you up with values. You were going, what kind of financial trouble you could be in? I mean, or, or difficulty you could have been in. You didn't have you, you, a chick nor a child. And yet you, you found yourself, or is it that you were you trying to live above your means? Or trying to impress, really? Okay, now, something along that line, now, um, as a child, I attended a Christian school, a quote unquote Christian So I would have been in an environment. I'm seeing people, children like me, my age, coming to school with shirts and band names, shoes, and you know, these kind of stuff. And you know, it, it hints at relative poverty, you know. Children compare themselves to their peers and that was part of my problem. I had enough to survive, you know, but being in an environment where children my age, you know, affording certain brand name food, shoes and this kind of stuff, you know, it really opened my eyes to, to, to want and more, you know. And as we said, Trinidad made me, maybe I was a bit lost, you know. You was a bit what? Maybe I was a bit enough. My eyelid was too long. Enough. <laughs> enough. Like, yes, yeah, I too long. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I learned something new here today. <laughs> so I that's mean, what. Look it, back, I can say that from nowhere. So right. Oh, so so and and that is a very 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 valid point you made there, that going to school and you seeing children, you know, Washington, when everybody else in a bar name sneakers. 
call. Yeah, I wash it call. <laughs> <laughs> and and you have a, you have close to me too when when others have iPhones. IPhone, yes, I know. And bad. that that played a little bit on your mind. So that. There you go, parents. I hope you're listening to that. So, so you decided. Okay, so then you got this job. What what made you decide to go get this job at the cinema? And and how often did you work? Well, I I got the job in the office vacation. Right. When I left presentation, I didn't have the time. And the reason for me getting the job was that I wanted to help my parents as I you know took on further my education. So when I started school, I was have worked on weekends and sometimes I would work on weekdays I'd stay home from school and I'd work weekdays and get children based on my school time table. Okay, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Iron Dependency and we are speaking with Akini Harry who is taking us on a little journey here of how he managed to get himself involved and he made some very good points early on you know, about attending a school that some parents allow children to have these expensive gadgets and, and clothes and, and so on and, and he wasn't able to and influenced by that. So he decided. And also the exposure to other other children who come from different environments. So the activities, the well the, the drugs and the gambling and you know that kind of activity that he was not exposed to at home but left home went to school and bam there it is yeah so you want to be like the joneses as we used to say mm -hmm. right so so what when did it all come to head how did the, the planning and preparation for this heist how, how did you all plan for this well where where we worked, we had access to what we call the office. So the daily earnings from the cinema would have to so be I decided to take pocket the, the keys to the box office and cut the key. And when I did that, we returned approximately two weeks later to steal the funds from the cinema. Right, so hold up. So you so you, you took the keys from the box office and you got it copied. All that happened in one day or how, how did that happen? How how long did you have the keys for? Yeah, that happened in like a few minutes time, like half an hour. Okay. Um you went to a key cutting place or you you, you pressed it in a soap and kept it? What? Yeah. What did you do? Yeah, I went and cut the key. By, by a key cutting. Yes, and I returned it. Okay, okay. The same day, right. Right. And so, that is part of the caper. You got through it there. And then, when did you say, did, when did you all decide to, to make the move? The move was made about two weeks later. I had a friend of mine come into the cinema. He didn't go there. He came into the cinema and a colleague and I basically diverted attention away from him. So we, we drew the, the worker away from the box office and he went in. He snatched the funds and he left. Okay. Now, before we continue, you had this key for two weeks. During that time, of course, planning and preparation with your friend went on, right? Or with the three of you. But didn't it occur to you that what we're going to do here is, you know, uh, maybe, uh, look, well, as, yeah, look, let us not go through with this. Did that ever cross your mind? I mean, you slept well knowing that you had these keys and this is what you, you all were planning? <laughs> If I say I slept well, <laughs> how bad could that sound? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we knew what we were doing, what we were doing was, was wrong. Uh -huh. yeah, um, but we decided to go through it. We 
decided to go through with it. Because Did you think you would so get away with it? Of course I did. No one commits a crime thinking that they are important. Right. Right. Okay. Now what 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 the, the, the what were the working conditions like to at the cinema? Because you, you mentioned that you were under some pressure there too as well work wise. Mm -hmm. Well, we worked long hours for a very low salary. Um, we didn't receive anything like overtime. The minimum wage would have been twelve fifty an hour. So we worked like sometimes as short as twelve hours, sometimes as long as fifteen hours a day. Right. Um, we had to engage in working duties that were not part of our job description. And I remember an incident around Christmas time in, in 2014, just before the, the incident happened. We were tasked with a job to help build a cinema screen in one of the auditoriums. You know, we were promised certain wages that we never received. Mm. Right. So that also had a lot to do with the events that occurred. Right. So okay. Leah had grows okay. as a, as we would say. Yes. You know, being being underpaid, overworked, and undervalued in the workplace. Right. So so you really didn't, as we said, didn't feel how doing planning and preparing. The, the boss they showed so to speak mm. yeah we, we we knew what we were doing was wrong it. <laughs> right uh, but you know based on these different factors coming together if you're just joining us ladies and gentlemen you're listening to our independency and we are broadcasting you live on 995.5 FM and live on the independency Facebook page. We are speaking with Akini Henry, who is Harry. Harry, yes. I don't know why I said Henry. <laughs> and and um, Sorry, he, yes. he's taking us through why he and his friends decided to steal from his employer the sum of $30,000. We're going to take a break. And when we return, we're going to get to the actual heist and when the police came knocking. Stay right there. As I said, any young man or family you need to, who needs to be hearing this, please get in touch with them. We'll be back. You're listening to Eye on Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Reality Radio at its best. Eye on Dependency. With Garth and Natasha. Reality Radio at its best. Where every life is a biography. Sundays at 6.15 p.m. And exclusively on I-95.5 FM. And broadcast live on the I on Dependency Facebook page. Kosona! Kosona! I come in, and don't give me no attitude there. You have she and her manners, boy. Hmm. I wish I had your touch, boy. You have to groom them. First, you have to target them. Scope them out. <laughs> See if they have low self-esteem, family problems, you know? Then you move in and gain the trust. I like your glasses. After that, you okay, feel a need. Some of them like nice things, like fancy phones, hairdos, clothes, food. It have ones who only looking for somebody to care and listen to the problems. So you feel me? What important do? You have to isolate them from the people. Let them believe it's all about you Forget and them. them. I care about you. Then you get through. Nice, nice. Look one right in. Try thing now. A message from the Counter Trafficking Unit of the Ministry of National Security. Hacer tareas domésticas no es trabajo infantil. Lavar los platos, limpiar su cuarto, 
recoger los juguetes y realizar otras tareas que fortalecen su personalidad en casa, no es trabajo infantil. Esas tareas enseñan a los niños a ser responsables y les preparan para la vida adulta. Denuncia el trabajo infantil, a la unidad de inspección del trabajo en el 299-0300, opción 3. O llamar a la línea para niños, en 131, o en la 804-321. Agricola is back with loan promotions that will make you go wow! Wow! 60 to 40 loan. For new members or members with no loan, get a maximum of $300,000 with just a 1% interest rate. Call or come into our offices at Pro Queen Street Arima, 667-7633, Pamela's Mall Marabella, 219-7745, Scarborough Tobago, 639-6468, or Port of Spain, 627-3127. Agricola Credit Union, your very own, working for you. My name is Joanne Ferdinand. I am a Justice of the Supreme Court in New York State, and you are listening to Eye on Dependency with Garth and Natasha on I-95.5 FM, Trinidad and Tobago. Alright folks, thank you for staying with us and keep commenting on Facebook. Akini, you have some support, but we're getting some good advice too as well. Akini, are you there? Hello? Akini? Oh boy. Is he, do you have him on the line? In the meantime, while you try to get him back, let me share some of the comments that you you're making on Facebook. Uh, Wendy Ann says, values inculcated at home consciously and unconsciously also help to shape an individual and determine future decisions and behavior, whether you come from poor or well-to-do. Uh, Bev says, one of the tragedies in life or searching for structure is the lack of mental strength. And Badao says, true life and Valerie is tuned in, says very informative as usual. So we are going to try to to get Akini back on the line and hope that the, the audio is clear and that you can hear everything that he has to say because we really, um, really think that um, his contribution this evening is, is going to be valuable, not just for the adults but the young people we have tuned in. And good evening to the St. James Police Youth Club tuned in as always nice to have you inside and any other police youth clubs or Rupun, i don't know if you're tuned in but thank you all for being with us this evening are we still trying to get akini back on the phone because we know we had some audio issues with him on facebook and i think um it's a matter of the internet connection oh anthony Math anthony says he loves the show thank you very much sir we love you too for loving this show and what we are trying to do um bringing real stories it is reality radio at its best and we try to bring the reality directly to you wow we having some real issues even connecting on the phone with akini unfortunately so um whew, we apologize for these i mean and last week was so perfect with three people on the only <laughs> on a video call but um you know these things happen um but if you're just joining us you're listening to i on dependency and we're trying to have a chat or we just had a brief chat with akini harry a young man who got into trouble got himself into trouble planned and, and executed a theft a, a theft not a robbery a theft at an institution where he worked and he ended up before a magistrate as as you will and spent a couple nights behind bars and he will when we do finally get him back he will tell you about that experience and how that really was a complete culture shock for him um, and when he went back in front of the magistrate 
um, she was kind enough to give him a second chance and not send him to prison as some young men prefer to do for some reason I, I don't know why but he was given the opportunity to to be on a bond to keep the peace and he took that opportunity and ran with it um, and that is the the overcoming and the redemption that we want to highlight as well so as we wait for a clear connection with Akini and trying to get another number for him so we're getting another number for him apparently that um with his location was giving him some problem but um what we what, what is your takeaway from this so far the fact that one he admitted that going to that school where he saw children um having gadgets more expensive than his and not being able to to afford that and then the the, the, in, the combination of the pressures and the job to get you know, what they the um what did they talk the overwork and underpaid and all of that mm -hmm. so he responded he and his friends responded by planning a heist so what they did he took a key for the box office where the money was kept where the money was kept and they they cut the key and the the they had a third accomplice they had a third accomplice cool. so the the accomplice he did they, both of he and the friend working there distracted the box office person who's who's in charge of the box office and then the friend moved in and took the money the now money. the thing is this was just a couple of years ago and they would have had cameras but they didn't study that either <laughs> you know so no, we but have that's why i asked if he thought he would get caught because yeah. i mean you have to consider every every eventuality yes when you're committing a crime i would i would think i don't know right so we have you know akini are you there now yeah i'm here oh okay. thank you jesus all right <laughs> and it's much better so speak loud into the phone and remember where we left off right just give me a reminder, please. Yes. So well, you were talking about uh, the the. I don't want to say heist. I think heist is a bit, <laughs> a bit too big of a word for this um, theft that occurred. And you you mentioned the fact that um, you slept very well throughout. Yes. Yeah, so I was asking you, did, didn't it occur to you that uh, if I, if we go through with this, we could get into trouble? Did that didn't occur to you at all, right? No. No, it did not. As I said, no one commits a crime thinking that they would get caught. Right. So, so how, so how did on the day of the activity you now? What was the plan? What were the plans? Take us through that. For those listeners who are just joining us. Well, there were three of us, myself and two other friends. Um, two of us work at the cinema. So the third friend. His job was basically to enter, go into the room, grab the funds, and come back out. Right. My co worker and I, our task was really to, you know, cause diversion, you know, so to, to, to take the attention away from the box office where the funds were stored. Right. You mind telling us what you told the box office person to distract them? I honestly can't remember, but we lose them out quite easily. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, so when, when they came out of the room, then the, the accomplice went into the room, grabbed the funds, and he left. Right. And you all went back to work as normal? Back to work as normal. Did the, did the box office person raise an alarm because of, obviously, Eventually, he, he or she he would discover that discover something that. happened. Yeah. Yeah. Within less than five minutes, um, she realized, and she she called the manager, and well, the, the cinema was located just below down the hill from the police station. Right. So the police came in like five minutes time. That is on this is on Penitent Street, right? Yeah, Penitent Street. Right. And. And you all just pretended you didn't know, you just kept on working as normal. Did they ask you all anything? Yeah, they asked us the question, but extensively. Hmm. 
um, did she suspect that well, it could have been both of you who set her up because you all got out of the box office? No, she did not. Initially, she did not. Mm -hmm. So what was the plan then to to retrieve the funds from your your the third accomplice? Accomplice. Well, the plan was that we would meet up the following day to spend the funds. Mm -hmm. So said, so done. Right. And what day was that? The following day. No, I mean, what day of the week? Was was a Friday, Saturday? What what day was it? I, I can't recall the exact day. But you had to go back to work the next day? After you all met and split up the funds? Oh, I remember it was a Saturday. It was right. A Saturday, and we went back to work the Sunday. And all that time nobody suspected anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they didn't suspect them. Right. It was only a few days after when, you know, they were running to foot it and whatnot. And they, they, they suspected something was up. And the police pulled the tapes and they conducted their external investigations. And the following Friday was when my colleague and I were arrested. Now, take us through the, those events now. What, what, wh where were you? Where, where, where were your friends when you all were arrested? Well, it was a Friday evening, to be exact, and I had just gotten home from football training mm. because it was during the football season. So I got home, I took a shower, and I was just about to begin some school work. And... I heard a loud knocking on the door, you know, and with the, the kind of knock that I heard, I definitely knew that that was the police, you know. I know what I had done, and no one comes knocking on your door at seven in the night with that kind of strength, you know. So my mother went to open the door, and the police barged in, and they asked for a Kimi Harry. There I was sitting, doing my school, pretending like I did not know what was going on. So they came, they questioned me, and I denied. I denied, I denied. They began searching the house, and they retrieved approximately two to three thousand dollars in cash, which was not the fund that was stolen, that was my personal fund. They achieved that and they deemed it as evidence. Hmm. They handcuffed me and they proceeded to put me in the back of the police vehicle. What was there your I yeah? What were you, what was your mother's uh, uh, reaction at this point? What was she saying and doing? Well, she was in denial. You know, I denied all allegations and she was in denial. My father was at work, so he had no idea what was going on. Hmm. My mom and my younger brother would have been home at the time. And, and of course, um, they, they, they were telling the police, all the two wicked, all the two wicked, he ain't do nothing. <laughs> no, well, um, my entire village actually came out. Wow. Where, <laughs> I, live, where I live, it's like a family, a family yard. Right. So I have uncles and aunties living close by. Um, one of my uncles and one of my aunties actually came out and they made a big scene here. Yeah, you're too wicked, you're too wicked. <laughs> um, my uncle actually tried to pull me out of the, of the police vehicle and a huge altercation occurred. And he was, he was also arrested with us for an obscene language oh, wow. of the man with him. Wow, so it's a scene. Yeah, what I've seen. And your mom was crying all that time, or what? Yeah, she was. She was embarrassed, yeah. Right. Well, yes. Well, we, we had to get to that part because um, I know what my mom would have done. She probably would have been, you know, she would have fainted, of course. And after the revival, she probably would have fainted again. Because police coming and knocking on...
people that age door to, for their child is something that nobody wants to experience. Correct. So they took you to the van, and when you got in the van, who you saw in the van? Well, my co worker was already there. So they they when I came before me and they retrieved a large portion of the cash. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so when I went, when they arrested me, they threw me in the back of the van and they basically intimidated me into directing them to the, to the party. Mm. So I took them down to the hospital where he lived and they arrested him. When we arrived at the station cells in San Fernando, my dad came down because he already heard what was going on. He came down, he left work and he came down. Um, they placed us into, well, they made us give statements and then they placed us into the holding cell mm. at the station. Now, um, was that, how old were you then? 18. 18. 18. Now, yes. I mean, I could ask some questions here and people will probably find, you know, I shouldn't ask these questions, but you so were, were, were you questioned in the presence of your parents or a lawyer or anything like that? But he's well, I was 18, so having my parents there was a Yeah. Okay, so what That's about... No, but I don't think it's supposed to go like that, you know, but I could be wrong. He's an adult. Yeah, I know, but... Yeah. At least if you if you asking you know questions about a crime, mm. you know, under that kind of fear people could say things that they shouldn't say. And this right. is why he, he should have thing. I think he should have he may I don't know what the law is, but he may have had the opportunity or should have had the opportunity to have a lawyer present when he was my, in my, my fear also were there. Right. Okay. Mm. okay. okay. It was a privilege because I I was eighteen. Right. Gotcha. I, I, I I was an adult. Yep. But what was that like for you emotionally and mentally having to be interrogated by police in front of your parents? It was something very difficult to deal with. Um, I was fearful. That was actually the first time I was arrested. I was fearful. I had no attorney. Um, and I was still basically trying to deny all allegations made. Mm. Yeah. Now, now when, when, when the handcuffs were placed on you, did you have any boil movement? Oh. <laughs> no, I, no, I am telling you, I would have, I would have pee myself. From the time... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I was very fearful. Yeah, but... but you, of that. you did that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you must. I mean, come on. I, I am telling you, <laughs> <laughs> Natasha. Trust me, you don't know what it's like to get arrested. I don't want to know. Right? I, I have no, in, have no intention of knowing. Good, but, but I could imagine. No, yeah, yeah. Boys get weak. <laughs> Trust me, <laughs> because because you know this. There's the night here. It's all over here. You know yeah, the jig yeah. is up, and the, the the bladder gets weak, especially. You know, it may not get diarrhea, but the bladder surely gets weak. And you always just feel this warm thing running on your leg. That's why sometimes men who stay in cell for a whole weekend, and that's why they contribute to the smell of the cell, you know. Yeah. Because people go pee themselves and yeah. go in the same clothes and they stay for the whole weekend and all of that. There is. So, so when they take it to the cell, tell us about that experience, because we had some of that in the sound bike. And... I want the youngsters who listen to especially to understand what you experienced in that cell. Well, that was a culture shock to me. Um, on entry, the, the cell itself was very dark. You know, the they couldn't tell whether it was night or day because there were no no lights um, in the cell. This is Marbella Police that Station? What station was this? San Fernando Station. San Fernando. Oh, yes, on the promenade, right. Yes. Yes, San Fernando. Right, go ahead. The, the, um, the cells were very dirty, and they placed my friends and I in the cell with, I don't want to use the term a madman, but a mentally unstable man. Right. So you could imagine being mm. 18, 
Bila nak ramai main serial sih, bila main in unsanitary condition tu terima, then what that was like, that was culture shock to me. Yep. And your, how long did you stay in the cell for? We stayed there for, well, we, we were so on the Friday night. So we stayed Saturday, Sunday, and we had court on Monday. Good grief. Wow. Now, now, so you had to sleep where? On the floor? Yeah, we slept on the floor, yeah. The cold concrete floor? The cold concrete floor. No, this, this seems a bit, I mean, I, I listen, I don't care what nobody say. There are certain things, even though somebody commits a crime, and you have to keep them to carry them to court on Monday, all the cells in all stations should have at least bunks nailed to the wall or something like that. A sink, a toilet. Come on. Basic amenities. No, people may find, oh, well, well who tell them commit crime? Listen, a 17-year-old boy stole his brother's car and knocked down a man and killed him, you know. And he didn't know, the brother didn't know anything till he got the call from the police. So, your child could end up in this position. So, I don't want nobody telling me, well, they don't commit no crime. And they say, listen, there's a certain human right involved here. And it is not asking much that we have these cells reconfigured especially the new stations i don't know the new stations that they commissioned are like that but i know the cell that i stayed in and i'm telling you the hole in the ground as he described because where you had to defecate akini because they can't spend a whole weekend without you know using the, using the bathroom yeah and you describe it as what a hole in the ground and you would stoop over it and you would defecate and well no water anything like that eh? <laughs> no water to wash your hands afterwards right no water no wonder no people try to kill themselves in this situation you know because uh, and so and and was there, was there toilet paper please no toilet paper no. come now man no it is wrong of course it's wrong i you know i I can't even... How did your parents react? Did they know the kind of conditions you were sleeping in, Akini? No, they can't see in the back there. Civilians don't go in the back there. Let him. Yeah, they, they, they weren't allowed to, to come in the back. No, civilians don't... I mean... And you weren't able to interact with them after you were put in there? No. Jesus. We basically communicated to the police officers. Wow. I want anybody listening to tell me if you would allow or if you think it's okay for cells in 2021 to have a hole in the ground to defecate in, no toilet paper and no water to wash your hands. Tell me. I hope you youngsters are listening to this. You know. Go ahead, Akini. So, so you had to, to did, you, um, did you, I don't want to know. What was your, I mean, you said it was a, a culture shock, yes, but what what were you and your friends discussing, if anything? What what was going through your minds? What did you think would happen to you? Well, we were basically regretting our actions. <laughs> hmm. we, um, we were also wondering, because I mean, at 18, being ignorant to the law, yes. we were basically wondering what would be the result of this, you know, where would our lives go from here? And that was on my mind the entire weekend. That was all I could think about. Mm. I hope someone in authority will be listening to this and understand that you're innocent until proven guilty, one. Correct. And it is unsanitary. It is unsafe. It is inhumane. It is inhumane. And if there are any cells in any station, any part of Sri Lanka that exists like that today, that needs to fix right away. Because you cannot have people defecating in a hole in the ground with no water and no toilet paper and all of these things. That's just wrong. That is just wrong. You could just murder somebody or you could just steal a fowl. It is just wrong. And, and I know some officers see that as part of your punishment. And, well, you look for that. Nobody can tell you and, and thief the people money or the... 
that is not their call. But exactly, that the police do not determine innocence or guilt, you know, that's not a job. And, and, to, and to, as I said, <coughs> excuse me, I hope these new, new stations are configured better. You know, I don't want to find out, but, by, by, but I'm, I'm just hoping that they thought of that because it is a human right violation, regardless of what. Because some officers do even think, well, hey, I could end up in them same cell too, you know. And officers did. There are some officers who did actually got arrested by their colleagues and had to occupy those same cells. Mm -hmm. So, you, w were you allowed? Were you all allowed to get food or clothes to go to court or anything? We eaten in that. Yeah, our parents were allowed to drop a change of clothing for us, and we received food as well. Right, and you had to eat food in that same condition. Not that being able to wash not being your able hands. to wash your hands. Yeah. It was. Oh, it had cockroaches in there, of course. God. Akini. Repeat. It had cockroaches there too. No, no, no. I didn't see any. Thank God. Oh, thank God. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I was in there, <laughs> when I was in there, cockroaches were climbing on top of the hole. Oh my God. Trust me. <laughs> So, you went to court the Monday? Yeah, so we went to court the, the following Monday. Mm -hmm. And, well, by that time, our parents would have put together some funds to hire an attorney. Mm -hmm. So, at the hearing, we were called upon to plead. And based upon the recommendation from our attorney, we pleaded guilty. Right. So the third party, he would have been 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. So the magistrate decided to conduct two separate trials. Right. My okay. son and I were 18. We had a joint trial. And then the third party, he had a separate trial. Yeah. So at our trial, we pleaded guilty. Um, we were sent to remand for tuition and sentencing. And what was the experience in the court like for you again? An another culture shock, because I'm sure you'd never been in a courthouse before. What was that like? Yeah, well, it was very intimidating, I could tell you that. No, wait, before you, before, and did you spend a day on remand too, not so? You did? Did you go up to remand as well? Port of Spain? No, we went to a man that Golan Grove. Golan Grove, right. What what was that like too, that experience? Well, it was ten times the worse than the than the whole in San Fernando. I could tell you that. We had to well on, on arrival no. Let me shot from by the by the court. So we were placed into the you know the amalgamated prisoner transport trucks and we were placed in small, small cells, just about one foot, or two foot by one foot, with a small stool that we could sit on. We were placed in there, and on arrival, so you man, we, you know, had to follow the, the, the usual protocol, take off all your clothes, coat and cough and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? And that was something new to me. <laughs> That was something new to me. Because um, you had a strip naked in front of everybody, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was... <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, on entry, we... We were placed in the western wing of the, of the facility. And while walking down the corridor, you know, we, it's only banging on cells and, you know, fellas... So, you know, words that you are kind of soft and intimidated, mm -hmm. you know, so we were eventually placed on a cell, um, there were approximately like 10 to 12 of us and, you know, there was no bed, no flushing toilet, um, you know, there was actually a hammock in the cell and, you know, the, 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 the big boy, as you would say, slept on the hammock yeah. while the rest of us had to sleep on, on carpets on the ground. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Independency, and we are speaking with Akini Harry, who is taking us through 
a lesson for youngsters to pay attention to this evening. Um, just making the wrong choice, what your experience would be. So you left, thank God you just spent one day on remand, one night. Akini? Yeah. Right. So you spent one night and then you we all went, went to, court. to court. Yeah, we, we went back to court. Right. Um, we had a hearing. Well, this was a bail hearing. We, we were granted bail to our short, horrific stay as we man was ended. We were granted bail and we were called to come back to court a month later. You know, so when we were granted bail, we had to return to the, to the holding cell at the bottom of the courthouse and, you know, fill out all the paperwork, the bail paperwork and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the end of the, the, the man's experience. Short, but horrific. Now, during all that time, you did, did it come to you, look, if I get a chance, I'd, I need to turn my life around. Well, after seeing that, that was enough to deter me. Hmm. That was definitely enough to deter me. Um, yeah, it, 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 it definitely was. So, so you would... I knew I think in your person, having seen that or having gone through that, I would like to believe that that would deter them too. So, so would you recommend that maybe young such should be given a tour of these institutions to see what it's like on the inside? I mean, people react differently to, to, to certain things, right? People react differently. Some, it might be to some, and others might, it might not be to them. So, the final appearance in court to the magistrate now. Tell us about that. Well, we had a few hearings. Um, on the final hearing, after the magistrate would have received testimonials from my past schools and done background checks with my, my community members, etc., we were placed on a two-year bond. We had to pay a fine and we had to compensate the, um, well, the fine was basically to compensate the cinema owner. Mm. Okay. And what were the conditions of the bond? We were to stay away from the, from the cinema, so we couldn't go near the cinema. We have to basically maintain the peace for two years, so no law violations. We couldn't get ourselves involved again with the system. Um, we had a probation officer who would have checked up on us occasionally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was basically it. Now, did you thank the magistrate at all before you left the court, or did you get a chance to? I did not get a chance to, no. Um, what about the, but won't you, well, you weren't allowed to go near to the cinema, so it's not to say, well, did you feel like apologizing to them too as well? Or did you feel, nah, them could rock so? I did, but based on the conditions of the bond, right. it could not. Uh, uh, did, you, uh, did you ever run into any of them after that? Like especially the young lady who worked at the box office? No, I did not. I did not. All right. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Andy Penasi, and we are speaking with Akini Henry, who escaped some time. How, how many years do you think he would have gotten if the magistrate went in a different direction? I'm not quite sure, but I believe three to five years. Wow. Right. And and that would have been enough to, to, to shake your world up. That's a long time for a non-violent offense. Yeah. But thank God she saw it fit to... To, to go in another direction and now you uh you have a degree in criminology yes so, i do so what did you do during that two years while you were on bond what was your plan 
for your life? Well, to be honest, um, I contemplated dropping out of school because mm-hmm. I was completely demotivated. Um, my teachers at school, some of them would have given up on me based on the whole situation. Wow. Um, you know, community members started shunning me and watching me in a different light. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that period was a very unstable one for me mentally. Mm-hmm. I was also still going to school at the time. I don't forget that. Yes. So I, I, I decided to finish my final year at school. And upon completing that final year, I would have gone on to enroll in the criminology program at UTP. Right. And what was that like, having to go to school and face the, the, the young men that you, and young men that you would have, you know, played football with? Did you, that, that was the end of your football career, I assume? No, I, I played one more season with the, with the football team. Okay, okay, that's good. I, I played one more season with the football team. But but did they accept you and and how did how did some of your colleagues or even teachers treat with you? My football team treated me just the same. However, the teachers at the school treated me differently. Mm. Some didn't want to deal with you and didn't want to teach you and all of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the sad part about this. Wow. Um, but you you overcame that and. You decided to pursue your, your your studies, and here we have it. Now you graduated with a degree in criminology. A wide criminology. Why criminology? Might I ask. Is that as a result of this experience, or definitely as a result of the experience? So hmm. my my passion growing up, my passion was always to become a professional football player. That was my passion. That was my dream. Right. And I was well on the way of achieving that because I was in line to obtain a scholarship to go to the U.S. However, the whole altercation kind of threw that, that, that plan off. Yep. Hmm. Of course. I never really had a desire to pursue academics. Mm-hmm. However, based on my experience and, and what I went to, I decided to study criminology and criminal justice so that I could help other young people who you know, experience life in a similar manner to me. Yeah. Yep. And what about your, your family relationships now? Um, your parents and your siblings, what, what was life like after this experience? Well, my family supported me 100% through the entire thing. Um, they didn't look at me differently. They did not treat me differently. They supported me. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Akini, and he's just telling us about... We have something. He, he spoke about the slop pail. I want to show you. You all heard about slop pail, right? So we have some images of that, the slop pail, what it looks like. I want to show you this drug, the Kush. And of course, we have drug trafficking images and, and the picture of the brother I told you about. And a young man was arrested. That video was circulating some time ago. We want to show you all that quickly before we take some calls for Akini. And I want to make a point by showing you that. Nothing but as a young man, you're not seeing his face. But I kept saying something here that I'm seeing young men committing crimes recently over the past two years and i'm wondering if it's the same thing when i was and my friends were using cocaine we never robbed anybody but you put something down i would go with it beg borrow steal now people have access to guns and cutlasses that they bought in people place and you would believe uh, there's a video of a young man snatching a phone in the night time snatching a phone from a young lady what do you think he's going to do with that phone he's going to carry that phone by a pusher and get two or three rocks for it. If you get two or three rocks, 
might get one, one and a half. And there are a number of people being introduced to crack cocaine in different ways. This young man who snatched that handbag in Woodbrook, he got from his friends, they put crack in the marijuana for him to smoke. And he became highly addicted. That now he's going around snatching people's stuff just to get a hit. I told you all that. I knew it. And this is why I asked, maybe the police could set up a unit to start taking toxicology, doing toxicology tests so that you understand that these, these young men are driven by a chemical and they're not really criminals. But they swallowed this drug and I, I keep saying it over and over. You swallow certain drugs, it's like you swallow somebody else and that somebody else telling you what to do. You have no control over it. So you see a hapless old lady standing by the side of the road and that voice inside you telling you, snatch the handbag. And you will snatch the handbag. I'm not making this up, people. This is how it really is. So, Kakini Holy Line, right? Short man, put up the... Um, I want to show youngsters what, what, what the slop pail looks like. And what slopping looks like. You see, there's it. And you see some men slopping. That is, the, the, those who go in the, the cell last, the, the, the most junior in the cell, this is like the military, you know, the most junior come in, they have to take really up the pail work. in the morning and carry it out. Now, the one on the top right-hand corner, that's the pigtail bucket. That is our slop pail. It has a cover, though. Um, that that is in the cell with everybody. I I can't even I, I can't even begin to contemplate having to raise the cover and sit on it or squat over it with everybody else in the cell. No, 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 no. And that that cell that Akini talk about with the ten twelve men. Yeah. If you want to use, you have to do that in front of everybody. Youngsters, I hope you all understanding this. Look, this is what this sloppy looks like. And you have to take up that with your hands and carry that outside in the morning and empty it and wash it out and everything and carry it back upstairs. <laughs> ah, Lord Jesus. This, this, I hope this serves as a deterrent to some of you. Let's go to the next image quick. Um, this, you see this here? This drug you see in here on your screen here now. One of these packs here is about forty dollars. No, in some in some places be fifty dollars. Now this is a drug that some youngsters ingesting, and some parents will tell you when they when they smoke this, they behave in very erratic ways. Some experiencing psychotic episodes. We don't know what it is, and I'm hoping to get in touch with the OC. Um, OCNFB. No, they're not OCNFB o anymore. ONIU. Right. Yeah. So that they could, you know, apart from doing a demonstration for us one Sunday, but explain what these drugs would have in them. Because some people tell me the child using marijuana alone, but they behaving, and what they tell, explain to me, is almost like behaving like a crack addict. Mm. The other image, as I said, go to Dr. Pottinger's page on YouTube and you will see it. Now, we want to congratulate the prison service. This is what somebody tried to sneak into the prison service. Marijuana in the sole of a shoe, a sneaker. But they were caught. Now, the prison service on top of the game. Can you, can you see this? Or yeah. Not I'm, right. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Right. Now, now the, the prison on top of their game. And obviously, you know, um, even when I go into the prison, so I go into do lectures and they would let the dog pass or on the car, I just still be jumpy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in the car, but I still jumpy because, you know, the, the, the prison step up the game where, where trafficking is concerned. And they just hold somebody. And let me tell you something. Anytime you try to traffic drugs in the prison and you get caught with it, they're not going to take the drugs and let you leave. Think before you do that, people. Think. Okay? Next image. I want the magistrate. Men in there want weed to smoke. So, sorry. This this brother you're seeing on the screen here at one time was 
the country one of the country's top basketball players crack cocaine and i'm asking the next magistrate that he goes before is charles march and this was on the news to send him to drug treatment court please if you, if possible let's try that and see because this is one who stole the toothpaste and i don't know if you heard that on the news i don't know i can hear i don't know if you heard that he stole four um tubes of toothpaste from a store and when the security here let me beat the security and all of that and oh, stealing toothpaste you think he want to brush his teeth he's not eating it either so. thank you but he will go in and out there's a revolving door still at the prison now look at this video coming up here folks i don't know if you all remember this case. this young man and he's he's he should be going before a magistrate soon again he was caught in woodbrook after he snatched somebody and uh, unfortunately for him an undercover police officer Snatch somebody's handbag okay and he was stopped by this police officer this guy's 18 years and I am hoping and praying that he is following the dictates of the magistrate because you wouldn't be lucky like Akini if you're not. So I'm just hoping. Ordered to to, he was ordered to, to, go to, to, report, to, to, to report to a youth club, a, youth club. a police youth club, and stay there and turn his life around. Try at least so before you go back to the magistrate, at least the lawyer and your parents and the youth club will have something good to say mm -hmm. about you she's trying to spare him another magistrate trying to give another youngster a chance at life he is only 18 just like akini was akini what would you say to this young man if what you had you an to opportunity to speak to him well i would encourage him to turn his life around because he is no better for those his and you know going in there the, the, the recidivism in Trinidad and Tobago is so high that when you go in there, you more often than not tend to come out worse than you went in. Correct. So I would definitely tell him to make the effort and turn his life around. And I'm asking the magistrate and the parents probably if they could ask the magistrate to send him to drug treatment court. This, this may help. This may wake him up. I'm hoping to God that we don't lose another youngster, another 18-year-old. Because look look at him on the ground, taking off his own belt for somebody to tie him up with. All because of crack cocaine. So he needs help. So whoever the magistrate is, I'm asking, I'm pleading on his behalf. At least we don't have the drug treatment um, facility in prison right now. So... I'm begging and the pleading. Best option the best option is drug treatment court. treatment court. Let's hope he would follow it. If not, then he will have to go to prison. And big people prison is not YTC. And oh gosh, and I am hoping one day that the prison service and all concerned will work towards reopening that that drug rehab facility at our nation's prison. It's really important. We really need it. We could save so many lives with that. The next picture. Um, short man I want the youngsters again to see uh, can you know if you've seen it that we spoke about this last evening this is me in my career when I had just started and the picture on the right is me in my golden grove kit hmm. you don't want a picture like this in your gallery you don't want a picture like this on your on, in, in your collection children you don't want it because this spells trouble for your future once you pose for a picture like this in the prison system and you get a number that's it unless of course you get a presidential pardon so that's me that's me as a youngster milk still in my mother face and the thin line between the military and the prison you see that line and i always say the servicemen to cross in that line you cannot come back it's a very thin line look at it and look at it well Maybe you all would learn something from it. I don't want to put on that blue clothes again. And I'm sure Akini don't want to experience that again either. What was going through your mind when this picture was being taken, girl? Again, my mother, my family, my comrades, my colleagues, you know, look where I reach. I am now 
in front and and akini will tell you when you reach up in that prison and they tell you take out your clothes trade in the corner here it's caught and cough and you're doing that in front like 10 15 people you know and this is when i pose for this photo is then when i really woke up and i said what the jail is this i seen this on tv all the time look here me you now look i posing for a mug shot this called a mug shot you don't want a mug shot youngsters you don't want a mug shot in your life <laughs> akin you have one right no I, I didn't get a mug shot you didn't get one in the prison either did they take your fingerprints no 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 yes 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 i i received the mug shot yes I yeah you must get i mean they must record that right yeah. because you enter the system they must record you um but i asked the prison for this picture so that i could use it during lectures especially for servicemen to see what that thin line is when you make you you cross that line what can happen and unless you get another the other the other image you see now is a presidential pardon this is what the presidential pardon looks like i have a presidential pardon but for another program akini has promised to do some research and we could get together now and discuss when should one get a presidential pardon and should i have to apply for it when or, sh or should it come up automatically like in akini's case he's a two-year bond right after the two-year bond is over should something come up on the system that says um okay or somebody he successfully completed his bond he right. can now his ex record can now be expunged so akini when you apply for a police certificate of good character what do you have to do well, I have to submit a court extract, and the court extract basically gives in detail um, what your case was about, when it was, and what was the result of that case. You know, so I have to submit that with my application to the um, to the police um, administration building, and when the certificate comes back, it basically states what happened in my um in my hearing okay the record doesn't come back clean but it gives us a detailed account of what happened what happened to my um trial okay i understood understood and the last one is for those of you who still wondering how to acquire this pardon there, there are instructions where you can go and we'll put that up on the screen for you to see if you know anybody needs a presidential pardon then you can start with this process i'm not telling you how long it would take but at least you can start with acquiring this document from the protective services division the ministry of national security and they, they it will guide you on what you have to get to get to acquire a presidential pardon again in akini's case if, if he completes his bond for two years then <clears throat> should that come up be flagged somewhere in some office or in some whether it's the attorney general or national security or wherever and he will get a phone call and say well all right or a letter in the mail saying that you've come su su successfully completed your two-year bond mm -hmm. now your record is expunged and you are free to i think i think that needs to be written into law that because in, in his case he had a probation officer right so there is a a monitoring element to to his bond right. so i think in cases like his and and perhaps others i mean i guess there would be you know scales of of how this takes place but once you have a um been convicted b served your time or your or your bond then after a certain period whether it's six months a year five years after that period of time and you have not committed any other offense your record yeah. is to be expunged of course they will develop a list of the offenses for which this is applicable non-violent offenses i would assume but there must be written into law that it is automatic you cannot send people to prison expect them to come out here and survive with a criminal record so that if they can prove that they have they have served their time to society they've already done that if they can prove that for six months or a year or three years or however long it is they have kept the peace they have not contravened the law in any way why can't their records be expunged, expunged? somebody asked what did i do well i was singing with a band and i sold the equipment most of it 
to buy crack cocaine. And I was arrested December 1990, and I did six months in prison. And so I, I, knew no, listener, well. I was, no, imagine, I was a, a lead vocalist in a band, Kalyan, led by Arthur Marcel and Stokely Bar and, and these brothers. I'm the lead vocalist in the band. I used to stay in the band room because the people where I stayed, where I was staying by in El Sikoro, um, in, in Valsain, sorry. Sell out all the furniture. Sell out all the people's furniture and they put more. So I had to ask the band room to stay there. The band owner, the band, band owner say yes, go ahead. And and I sold equipment from in there. Now tell me if that is not something driven by some other force. Not understanding that the same band I sing with, they would miss the equipment. But that urge to satisfy that craving for that drug was stronger than reason. Let's take some phone calls for Akini. Um, Derek, you wanted a call, so give us a call, 622. And that you wanted to find out what happens to the young men who leave different orphans at eight, orphan home at 18. I have no clue. Very good program. How will I be able to access? Straight into the wilderness. How will I be able to access the program after it launch, which I will be able to share with the family members and friends? You it can will go be on our Facebook page immediately after. Hello, good evening. Program. Hello, good evening. Good, good evening. Good evening, God. Good evening, Natasha. Hi. And to the gentleman, I want to congratulate him a lot. God, mm. you know, I heard you when you talk about the hole in the ground. But, you know, instead of the use any pail, that will be the better one for them to use because nobody have to tote nothing out. They just <laughs> stoop over it. How are they cleaning it though, ma'am? Well, that's what I'm going to explain it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, um, what it is I had witnessed in Saudi Arabia, they have this one with a hole, but they have a flush. So when someone have finished, they flush it. And although it is in the hole, it is a toilet, toilet bowl. Right, right. It's placed in there. So when it is, you know, one person go in and they use it, they flush it, and that person who finished use it, supposed to wash it with the scrub and the bleach and sanitize it. So um, it will be much easier instead of using this pail where you have to put your buttocks on top of this, somebody else come, they might splat it up, and you have to sit on it. And it is really this really disgusting to know they are not giving them toilet paper mm -hmm. and soap and water to wash their hands. Correct. Ex <coughs> Excuse me. I would really like to see something being done especially for that because that is not sanitary because when they get ill it will be worse again for them. Yeah. So at least they should put that in place and not this bucket. When I heard about this bucket, it is extremely disgusting to you to be going to sit and smell in this thing. And then the last person of have to tote out everybody, poops and go, no, it is rather disgusting. That is inhuman. Thank you very much. And you all have a wonderful program as usual. Okay, you're Thank welcome. You, look, look what this lady, somebody saying. The justice system on the whole is in a mess. In 1996, I went to court for use of obscene language. Mm. The case was dismissed. And I still have to use a court extract to get a police certificate of good character. That's madness. That shouldn't be. Hello, Not good evening. Not minor offense like that. Hello? Good evening. Hello? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the young fellow's name Akil, I think. Akini. Um, I just want to ask you a question. Sure, um, he's listening. Why is it, why is it I, I have the impression that young black males are very angry. And if you could tell me if this is true and why it is true. What, what, because you, you see them committing something that if there's an anger inside, or aggression inside, either they grow with it or... They will talk it by home. Why, why are young black men so angry and aggressive? I just want to ask him that. Is only young no. black men you see in that? Go ahead, Akini. Go Akini, ahead. if you can, I don't know if you have the answer, but. No, uh, because, I, I you, you know, you, if you see them do things, and it's, it's like. Call her, hold on, anger. call her, call her. Hold on yes. a second. Uh, actually, you can hang up and, and allow Akini to, to respond to you. Thanks for calling. Yeah, okay. Okay, man. Yeah, Akini. Natasha, could you repeat the question? I did not hear him well. He was asking, why are young black men so angry? Why are young black men so angry? Yes, he, he's observed that 
men are ex- young young men, black men in particular, exhibiting a kind of anger and committing crimes with a kind of heaviness or, or a kind of um, bubbling resentment or you know frustration. We, he doesn't know what it is, but he he wants your perspective or what you think might be causing that kind of attitude. Well, I could only speak from my experience. Um, right. I think that we have to look at we have to look at it from a cultural point of view. In that, many young black men come from you know single parent homes where we have high rates of father absenteeism. Um, we reside in in certain communities that place us at a disadvantage in life. Mm-hmm. And maybe that has a lot to do with the, the anger factor that he's speaking about. Yeah. You know, so we have to look at it from a cultural point of view. Okay, let's take another call. 622-3937. Hello, good evening. Hello. Hello, good evening. All right, you're kind of shy. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hello. Good Hi, evening. Good evening. Yeah, one. Good evening. Couple things. First of all, God let me jog your memory. In your discourse earlier when you spoke about drugs in school, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you remember I said, I remember somebody spoke to you outside where speech? Yes. Good. Yes. Right? And as I told him, my son was a teacher, he was in the car. The door was covering it up and he said, Daddy, I ain't telling you nothing because I know how he does operate. Mm-hmm. And two, at, um, I don't know if I missed it, to the young brother, the money they stole. What? Did it? They didn't, well, they didn't have time to spend it, so what did they return it to the to the owners or what happens? I'll listen off here. Thank you very much. I have left my Yeah, the caller wanted to know if you, the, the, the cinema got back the money, Akini. The police got back the money. Yes, they got back the money. Um I'm not sure what what came out of it because they, they got back the money as evidence. Okay. Okay. So what the court decided to do with the money. Right. So somebody listening to just sent me a message. And you're saying is that, um, and for those of you who are interested in knowing, a good behavior bond pursuant to section 71A, 71A of the Summary Courts Act provides that no conviction shall be recorded. Therefore, there is no need for a presidential pardon. So a good behavior bond, so uh, so you wouldn't need a presidential pardon, Akini. Thank God for that. But you would still have to get extracts when you have to go for uh, police to get a good character, get, right? Which is, uh, which is onerous. Yeah. So how I, I'm hoping that that can be fixed so that at least you won't have to go through that. So so wait, so every time you have copies of your court extracts so you make copies of it and carry it to the station or you just carry it and show them? Or they have to keep the copy? Well, they, 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 they make a copy because I have the original the document. Original. Okay, okay. <laughs> You know, I anyhow, that's another discussion. But um mm. so somebody's con- complimenting you and they look um they encourage you to go on and do a, do your PhD. I cannot wait to read your book. This Beverly Ann Crookshank says, Thank you for turning your life around. Please go on to doing your masters and PhD. I cannot wait to read your book. Yes, so I am doing my masters at the moment and I definitely intend to go in on to do my PhD. Lovely. Six two two three nine three seven. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. I was tuning late, but from what I catch up on, I want to first commend the young one there, Akini, and just encourage you to keep pressing, keep pushing on. God has been with you this far, and He will continue to keep you on till right. That you mentioned in your experience <laughs> where you were, let me say, rescued, right, by your band, given a place to stay, and you abused that. That was a band. I was rescued by a church organization or a church body, right? I too was given a place to stay on a church compound. And I, well, what they call now committed sacrilege. Hmm. That you had, I stole even the mic that was used to deliver messages. I stole that for crack okay. hmm. Church. Right? So I could relate to you. I could relate to Akini. 
I could just say, thank God for intervening in your life, in Akini's life, in my life. And for whoever is listening to this program, would be really encouraged, would be really inspired, especially for those who are involved as captives, as prisoners, in this court addiction, that they would be taken out by the grace of the Most High God. That you and Natasha and for all involved, please continue the good work. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, you. We want to give the final word to Akini. Um, any parting words as we wrap up? Well, I would leave my saying that we're encouraging any young man out there who's involved in criminal activity. I would advise you to stop and look at better ways of, of making a living because, I mean, committing crime could only carry you to places, you know, in jail or death. You know, so I would advise any young person to take the opportunity now before it's too late to turn the life around because not many people get a second chance at life like me. You know, so you may be the, the, the other one or the unlucky one. Yes, yeah? so I would talk with, with those who uh, can you um think Derek Shabadi wanted to get Derek and if we find Derek? Hello? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good I evening. Am Hello, good evening. Yes, is this I Independency? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, um, I'd like to congratulate you on a wonderful job that you're doing and for highlighting um, Akini's story. Mm -hmm. It was our pleasure. Um, it's yes. all in an effort to help the younger ones. Yes, so I just like to um, say, God <coughs> and Natasha, uh, that this is Wendell Wallace, and Akini would know who the individual is. But keep on with your great job, and you know, keep on, you know, encouraging these youngsters to come forward and share their stories. Thank you, Wendell. Thank you very much oh, for calling. Thanks for calling. Okay. Hello, Derek. Hey, brother, got you. <laughs> amen, Look, yes. amen. We get in, we're skating at the last. I beg you for that. Go ahead. <laughs> last, I have limited time. Yes. Let me commend that gentleman for 180 degrees to the wrong end. Brother man, I need to salute you. You have a lot to offer. We need you on board to rescue our, our young men, to talk to our girls, let them know. You know, you remind me of Wayne Chance. Mm. A second, you know, Wayne Chance, gone, but. The fact that you got a second chance immediately, my thoughts went on on, on my um, my late brother who did some excellent work. I want to congratulate you mm. for doing not just the good thing, but letting the magistrate and the court know that everybody needs a second chance. And you are a beacon. You have set a stage where you can make a case for so many young men. And here in lies the problem, brother God. Mm -hmm. He comes from a nuclear home. He's under negative peer pressure because it's something called positive peer pressure, of course. Yes. And there was no communication, or the parents did not even realize that his, there was a disconnect between the parents and himself, that he was under all that pressure with the bling and all that. So that we call on parents once again to sit with their children, chat with them, talk with them, let them know that you will provide later down the road. I mean, I have the bling now for you, but I will provide your basic needs. I will invest in education. We call on parents to set and make a, a, a greater relationship with the boy children. And by extension, using the young man not just to talk, but also to walk, you know, the areas where he's needed the most. And uh, I on dependency, I step up to the plate once again and as I address you know nobody I didn't hear the businessman and you know, emergency meeting saying that we have women grieving work 11 o'clock and because of the killing, we're going to provide transport from next week for them. Mm. I didn't hear no press conference mm. that uh, private companies are coming on board to ensure that, you, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. We seem yeah. to be very tardy in terms of that's why criminal element can flick a coin, a coin and say, okay, who's the next target? Diego Martin, St. James, South, because too much of our women are targeted and, and they are at the mercy 
at all these different set of elements. So my brother, I know uh, you, you have to be brave to come and share this testimony. And um, you can only see a light down the tunnel. So I would really love to get you to talk to Dr. St. James Duke Club, but all police Duke clubs, and by extension, train only to hear that voice, that voice of, you know, to really give them the empathy so that all isn't lost. But I see you show some tail, but you, you look young and nice, even though you make a little chill, you know, but... <laughs> yeah, I think you know, but I'm just so that I'm not sure that she fall in love with you. Goodbye. I'm telling you, it's not... Okay, all right. No, not even, sure, the other one. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. I only pregnancy um, and to your, to your guess. Yes. Excellent. And I really trust that this tip is copied and it's sent to so many talk organizations. Thank you, Derek. It will okay. be. We'll and we hope you have on um on Facebook again on our Facebook page. I think Shortman just put a link in the, the yes, chat. Folks. So but it will be available on our Facebook page and hopefully soon YouTube. Yes. Replying to Beverly and Akini, please feel free to keep in contact. Yes. God bless you all, you folks who joined us on Facebook, you loyal so followers much. and, and, and listeners on the radio and the new folks who, j- who came on. Thank you very much. Spread the word. We're here every Sunday evening from 6.15 p.m. And we'll continue to bring those stories, those biographies and those real life situations so that it can move you, inspire you and encourage you to do better and to let your young ones do better. We have a lot of work to do, people. We have a lot of work. Arikano up next. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Short man. Good crew. night. Annet Maguire and the crew. Ah, Nakini. You still there? Hey, Akini. Sorry. Akini, you still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So thank you too, brother, thank for you again. spending the time with us. Say hello to the family for us. And you keep climbing to the top. Will do, brother. It's a pleasure. Take care, right? We'll keep in touch. All right, cool. Okay. Bye bye. Good night. Good night.